program on deltas and we are very happy that we can um, uh, team up as Wageningen with Asia Mega Delta's initiative of CGIAR. Uh, and in this way, we bring many different researchers together um, and we try to discuss our ongoing work. Not necessarily uh, everything is brushed up and shown as excellent results, but more a kind of work in progress. And we very much welcome everybody's suggestions or questions. And because we work with researchers from different backgrounds, uh, it could also be that if you do a research which is slightly related, you could have questions because you can use the results of this research in your own research. So feel free to come forward with questions. Um, we record the sessions because uh, we like to make them available to colleagues who cannot be here at this moment or other interested people. And we also invite you to join us on uh, for our after talks in the uh, platform that is hosted by the Netherlands Food Partnership. Uh, and I'm sure uh, the, 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 the link will come in the chat at some moment. Um, this is the introduction from my side. Uh, Ola, would you like to add something before we give the floor to our speaker of today? No, not much. Uh, just maybe that uh, I'm very happy that uh, with this uh, webinar series, if anybody has ideas how we can further increase participation, uh, send an email to me or Katarian, and we're happy to reach out to other networks as well. Okay, thank you very much, Ola. And uh, without further ado, uh, I like to hand over to uh, Charlotte. Uh, and yet, I think, because uh, are you going to talk both? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, today uh, to talk about Delta's livestock and climate change and to explain to us the critical a wicked problem subtitle. <laughs> uh, Charlotte and Tiet, the floor is yours. Um, at about 20 minutes, we will give you a warning signal so that. Uh, we we can have sufficient time uh, to um, have the questions also and uh, to the audience. If you have any question, you can already uh, start writing in the chat uh, so that we can, after the presentation, address all your questions. Charlotte and Chet, the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pity I can't see you, but maybe later when the floor is open for everyone. Um, thank you for, for joining this uh, Delta talk, uh, Delta on uh, livestock and climate change. Uh, as Katrien already mentioned, um, or happily mentioned, it's ongoing work and it's a big puzzle. Uh, and I would like to share uh, this puzzle together with you and also see how we can uh, move ahead. Um, I hope there is a little bit background noise. I, I hope it's okay. Otherwise, I ask people to to leave here. Um, so um, at this moment, um, as you see in the first slide, uh, I made this presentation together with my colleague Teun Vellinga. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't come. He couldn't join. Uh, but luckily, Chet uh, wanted to to join, and he will. Um, uh, explain a little bit of what we're doing at the moment um, in Vietnam, as we are in Vietnam at the moment at the Travin University. Um, okay, so Delta's livestock and climate change, a wicked problem. Oh, why is this not working? Uh, now it's working, right? Yeah, okay. Yes, we see so, the next slide coming. Yeah, okay, so uh, in this presentation, we first talk about a little bit about the, the most important challenges of livestock uh, production in Delta areas that are faced with climate change. Um, and then also understanding what, what is the real impact or what is the actual impact and, and the puzzle that we are working on um, and, and the follow-up uh, activities. So uh, as you might already know, so maybe this is a little bit of re repetition, 
but river deltas are very important for uh, food systems. In, I think in Mekong, they call it uh, the, the rice bucket or the food bucket of Vietnam, the Mekong Delta. Uh, it's important because it's a fertile area. Uh, there's a lot of river systems, so the access is really good for transportation and trade. Uh, there's a rich biodiversity and ecosystem services, uh, a lot of water. Um, and uh, therefore also good for livelihoods huh, to, to settle and um, to, to, uh, to, to provide themselves uh, with food. Um, however, there are, there are also challenges at the moment. So there's an increase of population, there's urbanization and in industrialization. La land scarcity is, uh, is applicable for all of the sectors. And now, because of climate change, we can see that there is even, well, more challenges ahead and we have to see how to tackle them. For uh, in those food systems, livestock is an important, ha has an important role. Um, they are an important food source. They have the ability to convert uh, products or crop products that we cannot eat directly. So they convert crop byproducts. Uh, or byproducts from processing or from residues. However, they can also compete with us because they are also suitable to eat primary products that we can eat as well. Uh, so sometimes this is kind of, uh, how do you say, interrupting. Um, but they're also important for uh, providing manure uh, to fertile the soils for crop production again. Um, in uh, so at this moment there are already some challenges for for livestock in the delta so for instance uh, natural flooding yeah, if it's flooding uh, animals cannot walk so they have to move out otherwise they, they uh, how do you say uh, they uh, <laughs> okay. it's okay so they have uh, high humidity there's uh, diseases and yes. pests uh, there's a, a insufficient uh, infrastructure and there's not enough land available. Um, and with the, the increase of population, wealth and urbanization, we can also see now that there's additional challenges already, not, not even with, that, with climate change. So there's an increase of comp uh, competition for land and water because also livestock need land and they need water to to walk to move but also to uh, to produce crops and to drink water um, but also because there's more um, livestock production going on because of the demand that, that's going up we can also see that there's an accumulation of nutrients if they don't have enough feed in the in the delta itself to produce or to provide feed they import and with the import of feed accumulation of nutrients uh, goes up and uh, well for instance eutrophication is a really uh, familiar phenomenon in uh, delta areas so um, this is at this moment already uh, a challenge and in general also livestock is an important source of uh, emissions to water and air um, with climate change uh, we can also see now that this is uh, kind of um, facing also livestock production. Um, the problems that are already in the deltas are are uh, amplified. So it doesn't mean it means that uh, the problems that are already here are increasing. They're they're getting worse instead of really new ones. Maybe it's the interaction of factors or problems come together. They're more they're interconnected. Uh, but as we understand now, uh, it's more amplifying that uh, instead of introducing really new ones. So for instance, sea level rise, the increased frequency and density of rainfall, so there's flooding and there's more humidity and there's a mix between seasons, um, heat waves that are uh, elevating the, the temperatures, uh, causing heat stress. And uh, as I told already, uh, increased humidity. Um, so there's, 
it, there are numerous challenges, uh, but we uh, we focus mainly on the salinity, uh, drought, and elevated temperatures for the for the rest of this uh, of this presentation. So if you have the role of livestock in food systems uh, horizontal, and you have the deltas and the, and the challenges in deltas of livestock at the, at the left side. If you put those in a matrix, you can see where they kind of touch each other and what kind of uh, problems are already there without uh, thinking about the climate change uh, challenges. So, for instance, with the high density of population and, and livestock and uh, an important source, food source for humans, you can see that um, the, the in increase of population also creates more or high densities of population, but also livestock. So, for instance, there's more risk of zoonosis. Uh, there's sometimes a lack of hygiene. There's water and air pollution. Uh, there's nutrient accumulation. Um, as a user of residues uh, and a competitor of uh, for for food or feed, uh, we can also see that with increased population, there's uh, increasing demand for feed. Well, at the same time, there's also increasing demand for crops. So they both need water and land sources. So this is kind of, um, this is causing problems because, uh, well, they're competing with each other. So you have this feed food competition that in Wageningen University, we often uh, mention in this, in, in the Netherlands, for instance. Um, also with high densities of population and livestock, we can see that industrialization and efficiency increases, especially for monogastric uh, animals. Um, and this again increases uh, nutrient accumulation because it means that with higher efficiency, so there must be uh, higher uh, quality of feed. Um, so they import it because sometimes the feed conversion ratio of imported feed is better than what is locally available. Uh, so again, in, in this kind of situations, you can see that nutrient accumulation is increasing, meaning that there is an overload of manure. And uh, with uh, and not enough land, well, you cannot, uh, you, you don't know where to put the, the manure or where to leave it because it's causing uh, uh, pollution. Yes. Um, so, um, again, also with land scarcity, we see that when the land is scarce, um, costs go up. Uh, if there's more demand for, for, uh, for food, uh, it drives markets in, in case of crop residues. So byproducts become, uh, become, val uh, become valuable because they have a price now instead of being just a waste of crop production. And uh, in industrialized areas where you have high or big um, uh, animal production uh, plots, you can see that also there's uh, complaints of, of neighbors, of people, because there is a smell, uh, because there is noise, because there's a, a more emissions, uh, which causing maybe uh, problems or health problems to humans. And now with climate change, you can see that those Challenger, uh, challenges are increasing. So actually, uh, existing problems are amplified by climate change. However, we also know from past uh, uh, research in the Netherlands, for instance, that in some cases, uh, livestock could be the solution of climate change issues. So in the net, oh, I will talk about it later, actually. So, um, so when we started this project of Deltas Under Pressure, it was uh, the title at that moment. Um, we started off with the problem salinity is affecting or negatively affecting livestock production uh, in Delta areas. So we focused on fresh water, but just after we started with with understanding the problem or the impact of salinity to uh, livestock production systems, we understood that also heat is kind of connected because uh, if it's too hot, they need more water, they pant more and they resp resp their respiration goes up. 
so they need more water. But if the water is salt, well, uh, they cannot hydrate uh, enough to cope with the with this new situ situation. But when we started to understand this interaction, we also came to the conclusion that in much of the situations, for instance, in Bangladesh and in Vietnam, the feed is lacking. So there's not enough quality and quantity of feed yes. for animals to um, to meet their nutrient and energy requirements. So they cannot go with uh, this challenge because they don't have energy enough anyways. So they're weak from the start. And with this new challenge, their resilience goes down. Then we understood that there's also a difference between breeds, between animal types and between breeds. So a local breed can more easily adapt to the local situation than uh, importing, for instance, a Holsteiner in uh, Bangladesh, because they're totally different animals. They need different environmental conditions. So again, uh, there's, an, there's an addition to the challenge they already have. And then tackling those challenges are uh, for an, for farmers is really uh, really difficult because in most cases they don't have enough income or they don't have enough uh, means to invest in new housing uh, or the hygiene or uh, making the animal more comfortable and meeting the common agricultural practices. So with all this all these factors together, well, my colleague Tuyen calls it the hydra of learning. So it's a multi-phase problem. There are many things that are coming together if we are want to tackle salinity uh, in delta areas. Um, so keeping this in mind, we try to, to kind of facing this puzzle. But then we also understood from our first visits to Bangladesh that it's also a wicked problem. And why? Because it's a hard defined problem. There, it's really complex. It's uh, every situation is different. Every farmer is different. We talk about farmers, but actually every farmer is different. We have livestock, we have goat farmers, we have big farmers, but we also have small farmers and mixed farmers. So it's it's not it's not easy to compare those together or to have one kind of conclusion about a farmer. Um, and then there's regional conditions which make it different in every case. Um, also, the, the problem can be faced differently from different scales. So for an animal, for a farm, but also regional and national. Then there's a lot of men or there's a lot of stakeholders involved, all with their own ideas, with their own disciplines uh, and with their own priorities and how they perceive or explain the problem. So in the right side corner, you, or my right side, I think it's also your right side, you can see that there's a lot of men around an elephant. And it means that if you're from different backgrounds, you look at the problem differently. So you see one man looking at the, at the nose or one at the ear, and they only focus on this point. So they don't have the overall view. They only look at this one point. So they never come to a really effective solution because if you just focus on one of the of the problems or a small bit of the problems you will never tackle it because you need the whole system so every situation is unique um, and for every situation it's not easy to to find solution because if you want to try things out um, there's a lot of at stake, so we can ask a farmer to try something, but if it fails, then he has a problem because he will his income will decrease or his animals will die and you don't want an animal to die, right? So there's also a lot of stake and, and this makes it also really complicated to exactly know what to do in which situation. So there's no, um, and, and then again, so, if you have all these factors together, um, one solution for one thing can be a problem for some something else. So if you look at the food system, and, and for instance, we see that in, in some areas, uh, rice production is not, uh, is not applicable anymore because it's too salt. 
well, they can change into different crops. But the next farm is a, is a livestock farm or a cow farm, it has a cow as cattle, and he will have a problem because the rice farm is not producing any rice anymore, but maybe pomelo. But then he doesn't have any feed for his animals because he was always buying the rice straw of his neighbor farm. So it's a negative trade-off or a ne negative effect to, uh, to another production system. So again, you see that uh, here we have a problem. Also, there's differences between short-term uh, solutions and long-term. In the short term, we can say, well, let's import a breed. But in the long term, it's, it doesn't make sense because this breed needs other environmental condition. Maybe it needs more feed. So if all farmers together change into another breed, a more higher productive animal, you can see that there's a problem because, well, there's not enough land and there's not enough water. So how, where can we find feed? And they don't have enough income to import feed from other areas or other countries because they they don't have enough income or uh, these kind of things. Is it already 50 min 20 minutes? Oh shit! Okay, I see you, Katrin. <laughs> kind of warning. Speed kind up. Of warning. <laughs> make, okay. Um, so and then if you have solutions, you continuously have to evaluate and adjust because yeah, it takes time. So, as I said, there's no silver bullet. There is no one solution, but it's always a combination. And you have to be together with different disciplines, looking at the problem and work together and talk the same language. Different disciplines have other jargon, have other uh, languages. Well, we have another language, but also di different uh, disciplines together, they have other languages. So having a co common idea of the problem uh, is the first step. And then you have to kind of together also try to understand what's going on. So in Bangladesh, uh, again, we saw that there was, they said, the farmers, they said there's a problem with salinity. However, um, we also found out that they never checked the water itself. They just heard from others. So there were, so there was a story, a narrative going around. But when we checked it, we did fact finding, we saw that it was not really the, the salinity that was the biggest problem going on. So also joint fact finding is really important. And also, again, these trade-offs and consider what there's no best solution. So together you will have to decide uh, what to do because there will be always negative and positive. Effects. Um, so here you see uh, uh, some pictures of uh, Bangladesh where we've did our first field uh, visit, and here you see some cows uh, drinking. And this is this is an important picture because here in this farm we found out that it was not the salinity that was making this cow sick. It was the hygiene of the farmers that make the cow sick, because the the symptom is the same. Diarrhea um, was the symptom that they complained about, but it was not the salinity. It was the bacteria in the water because of the hands of the farmers. Here you see a sheep that is eating alternative feed sources. So this is also important in time when there's salinity, you can find out if there is a problem with uh, some feed product, you can find what are other uh, available crops in the area or, or plants that can be eaten by uh, animals and how does the animal perform. Um, here you see a picture also very important because we also try, as, as I said before, to, to join together. So at the left side, you see it, and you see that there's a whole line with, with researchers. But on the other side, it's the, um, the local government and a veterinarian. And in the back side or in the front at the other side, you can also see that they're farmers. So we try to also discuss together what's going on. Uh, and, and understand the problem more. So here you see even a farmer, you know, writing on the screen to for us to better understand what is his challenges and how that he, how is he thinking that, what kind of solution does he think will help him to tackle climate change or salinity and drought in this uh, case. So um, I'll just skip this one. 
Um, and now we are here in Travin uh, because uh, our colleague in the same project is working on uh, salt tolerant quinoa. So we know that uh, that there's issues with feed in Travin. You can see a picture now of the Travin province or part of the Travin province. And uh, because we are finding out what kind of alternative feed sources are available, and our colleague is, uh, is uh, researching quinoa, we said, well, maybe we can find out the, the, the composition of quinoa uh, right. residues. Yes. Right. Uh, and, and see how we can maybe use this as an alternative feed source. Um, so maybe you can tell us what, what we were doing the last two days in uh, Travin and how we are trying to work together on this problem. So what we did. Yeah. Uh, and two good, minutes. good afternoon, everyone. Uh, actually, for two days survey in uh, in, in uh, Yinghai, this is Travin Robin. Uh, we we get uh, many many uh, useful in information from from farmer and and we know that uh, the farmer have uh, many many problem with with their animals and you can see in the in the map they we divide it in two area one is for goat production in the near the sea and inland you can see the the, the big cattle production. And we we did uh, actually the the farmer even the local woman they they already know that the impact of uh, salinity uh, on on their animal so they know that uh, some kind of animal can adapt with the the salinity even the heat uh, heat stress or the high temperature and however um, one thing that um, some kind of the some some kind of like the ingredient or the water quality maybe they don't know the, the quality of the feed or, or ingredient some ingredient so that may influence on the, the the animal production so during the survey we uh, we we have uh, collect the the some some kind of feed and then we go back to uh, to uh, and then we will bring to analyze in the lab um, laboratory and then uh, also evaluation the the in vitro digestivity and we want to see that and what happened with the diet what happened with the the uh, the, the the kind of feed in, in the animal and here it's just it's more thing i think in the for the further we are not only in the charming robin but also we can another in you can see in the 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 sub chunk we have on also have the interesting case case it in in sub chunk may the end also the uh, the the beef cattle but the beef cattle from sub chunk robin may be in high uh, production compared to the the Chavin Rovin, and I think that in in South Chang Rovin, the the farmer have a more investment than 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 in in uh, in uh, in Chavin Rovin. So just I just um, summarize it some information for you, and then maybe in the future when we have, we got the data, and then we have the full uh, full uh, paper or full report, and we maybe we have. Uh, the news knowledge and uh, and uh, for the further research. So okay, Chen. Yeah. So there's many more to say, but the uh, time is up. Um. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Sorry to delay. Um. We would like to come back uh, when we have results. <laughs> so one 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 more thing. Uh, one more thing. Uh, I would like to say that actually is uh, Charlotte. Uh, she uh, she does very good. Very good uh, presentation and even uh, information. The whole thing she recent today it uh, in 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 the presentation. The on of other information and um, actually I very interesting for for that because when I explain it for for her and on more thing he give in a presentation. Uh, I I think it I really really, really interesting about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's very nice to to see two very committed researchers and your good interaction there. Uh, thank you very much, both uh, Tit and uh, uh, Charlotte, for your interesting presentation. Uh, I I think we now understand uh, how the wicked problem is actually a, a a problem with many faces, and so 
for solutions, we are also looking at many different uh, points. Uh, I like to ask the audience, I didn't see any questions coming up in the chat yet, but can somebody uh, indicate who would like to ask a question? Please raise your hand. Oh, yeah, I see the hand of Paul coming okay. up. Paul, go ahead. Hey, sorry, just trying to find all the buttons. Yeah, thanks very much for that. That's really interesting. Um, can you, I might have missed it. I find these Zooms a little bit hard to concentrate all the time. Can you give us a sense of the scale of the cattle production? So it's beef cattle, not dairy. What, are, there, are we talking three three animals per household or are we talking sort of more commercial scale? Could, thanks. Yeah. Uh, and Paul, so just mean, for our information, sorry, Charlotte. Uh, Paul, yeah. you 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 are in which team, and with which background? Oh, I beg your pardon. Um, so I'm I'm involved with the an ACR project in Vietnam, um, and and looking at so my roles in the socioeconomic sort of and farmer adaptation side of things. Um, with an ACR project in the Mekong Delta. So okay, no, but, thank you very much for clarifying I'll, that. Uh, I'll because... have a few questions. I'll have a few yeah. questions, but let's do one. one <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. Charlotte and Tid, go ahead. Well, yeah. So, um, should I start? So, in in this case, so for this for this case that we're looking at now, we're we're trying to focus not on the the smaller ones, but more in the middle, because you really have the the big intensive farms, right, with more than what 100, 500 uh, cows. Yeah. Um, but in this case, it's more like five to ten cows. Yes, it's very small. It's it's yeah, it's more the the, the middle mixed uh, farms. Yeah. Also, the the the, the main income from from the the farmer is come from the the animal, and yeah. be, because uh, like the Charlotte also share with you that the the income very low income from a farmer and they don't know plan and they have to uh, uh, cutting the rat in the road side and co collect some the natural rats. So if the implant by the salinity, maybe no water and no rats, and normally the farmer have to buy the right jaw, but the right jaw is very low, low nutrition, and may animal will uh, affect on the productive reductions. So um, the second thing that uh, the farmer also concerned about the high, Production animal. So normally they will um, will um, mess with the like the some 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 the uh, the breeding from the European country like the BB BBB breeds or some the Charolais from France. So it with the low um, low nutrition diet, not satisfy the nutrition requirement. So also the problem. Uh, even we have we can see the high seed, we can see the housing condition. It's different. So if the high temperature will influence directly to the animal, normally the animal will increase the respiration rate. So many, many things happen during the, the, the hot season, not only the salinity, but also uh, another factor. Yeah. Yeah, and I think also what we saw yesterday was kind of interesting because so it's dry season now, it's really hot. And yeah. they give rice straw to those animals, and no, but uh, no water. They give the water only two hours later. Yeah. So you know, yes. when you have dry bread in your mouth, yeah, they, they don't want to eat anymore. Yeah, and, but we small. Yeah, and so one day, maybe yeah. in the future, maybe we have like the soft training for them because they don't know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's Thank even you in very much. Oh, you, you have more questions. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Oh, let, let keep going. Let someone else ask. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm inviting other speakers, uh, other uh, people in the audience with questions about this research. If not, we can also tell a little bit about what we're trying to do here because it will help maybe also to get some questions going on. 
going okay, ahead. I, I would I would like to ask to you in a way. Well, um, yeah. of course, I like to hear more. Uh, however, I think it's interesting. Um, uh, our Asia Mega Delta's colleagues, I, I think there are no uh, live e livestock experts on the team as such. Uh, however, it could be that in uh, the research, uh, what what of this research uh, uh, of uh, Charlotte and Tiet is what is kind of uh, of this research is useful in your research or what uh, further questions would you have? And uh, the question to uh, you, Charlotte and Tiet, is in a way, what would you like to know from the other colleagues uh, and what would be helpful to your research? So I give it to you first, Charlotte, and the other uh, 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 people, please put up your hands so that we can also uh, detect, detect you easily for your questions. So at this moment, I think already the low hanging fruit is that, um, well, livestock pro provides manure. We saw that there's a market going on in, in uh, Travin. So one of the income of, of farmers here is selling manure to, uh, to kind of traders that send it to the highlands where they produce coffee and tea. Um, so it's a provider of, uh, of, um, of, fertilizers um, but also I think I, I expect that a lot of crop scientists are here and I think that it's also important to understand what kind of um, alternative feed sources there are so what are now in research alternative uh, products being investigated and how can we make a double purpose of them so how can we use how can we find solutions in a landscape approach that with the scarce land that we have, uh, you produce the crops that could also that where there's also potential uh, for feed because in those areas we have those livestock animals as well. So I think those are very important and they're numerous, right? But I think these are at least uh, low hanging fruits. And then also understanding better the the fluctuation. Of, of weather data, of uh, salt uh, content in the water, um, because it's not the average where there's problem, it's it's the, the peaks where we have a problem. And sometimes you only see average of data. So for that's a challenge now for us also to get some more grasp of these peaks where we see that there's really a problem. Do you have other things? Okay. Okay, thank you very much. and and. What I really like uh, about your questions, uh, Charlotte, is also um, uh, we, we, have, we are analyzing the situation as it is, but we are also looking what that means towards the future. And then if we can bring different type of information regarding that future together, that will also help us making decisions on yes. uh, where to go. Yes. And that might then yes. be not only in the uh, in in the livestock area, but it might also be in other areas. Uh, I like to give the floor to Robendra, uh, who also has his hand up. Please come in. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, and please introduce yourself uh, briefly because I think most people don't know you yet. Yes, uh, this is uh, uh, Robendra Sundar Shorkar. And I am working in the Bangladesh Climate Smart Livestock Project. This is actually USDA funded project. I said, Catherine, you know. So I met you with you earlier. So I've been working as a climate smart productivity lead. So, but I want to a uh, little bit uh, discuss and also ask the question because we are facing some sort of a challenge in this project. So currently, you know, the smallholder farmers, they are suffering to get the either the green folder or the roughest. So they are mostly use the straw, you know, the rice straw for the uh, fodder purpose. So because they have no enough land and also pasture land, so that's why they cannot collect the green folder. So and they cannot feed to the their cows. <laughs> but it's a good opportunity, good opportunity in Bangladesh so some of the crops, seasonal crops like the potato, sweet potato, and also the groundnut. 
So in terms of ground groundnut in Bangladesh, more than 40,000 hectare grows. But problem is some farmers, they collect in the, you know, the phenotypic part and, and the short time they use as a fodder, but after dry, they cannot use as a fodder. So that is the problem. Even in the uh, potato, huge area grows in potato, even in the sweet potato in the chore area. So my question is, if there are any technology from the research side that helps to that kind of you know, the crops buying or the phenotypic parts store in the long time without depriving the nutritional aspect. So that would be good for us so that we can support to the farmers. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a very interesting question. And the, the, just to summarize, if I understood correctly, the sweet potato and the ground nuts, these are crops that are coming up. These are potentially very interesting crops for um, uh, fodder. Um, but uh, be, beyond the, the, um, the season of those crops, you cannot store them. So your question is if there are possibilities to improve the quality of the feed uh, while yes. storing it. Uh, I'm, I'm putting it uh, loud, over so. to our livestock colleagues, but I'm also in the audience. If there are any of the crop colleagues who could uh, have a light on this, uh, please feel free also to put up your hands. Over to Charlotte and, and uh, Tid. You say yes, right? You want to answer? But I do the things. Yeah, he's asking about how can we store uh, the the residues of uh, groundnut and sweet potato. No, no, never starts. You see, uh, um, so uh, actually, uh, there are many, uh, there there are many methods for the store of the fish. But you know, when during the survey, the farmer no, never, never were, were stories, just like the right jaw and directly to the some kind of the content, just like right brand or broken rice, something like that. Because actually, they know that if we, they store it or they make some the line of silage, it's it good for the animal. Yes, but um, the, 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 the farmer is um, maybe, maybe they, no, they have no land or they don't want to apply for, for, for that method. And maybe also uh, no one to tell them. So we, we don't know uh, exactly at this moment, but we know some of the technique technique to improve improve the, the, the diet from the animal. But but maybe I'm I'm not sure. We we need to uh, to interview in detail and add add them again. And actually in the questionnaire, um, in the questionnaire we, we we actually at at this moment we don't have this information. Maybe we uh, we add more the information like the that that um, very interesting. And we also confirm that. Is, is it uh, the, the farmer know that information or they don't know? And then we have to improve that information. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for that answer. So so the the it it's not so clear um, that at the places where that this crop residue is, people may not be aware of storing it for fodder, while at the places where there is a need for the fodder, uh, yes. They may not be aware of how to get it there. So, Ramendra, you you actually asked a very uh, uh, a good question, and uh, as as far as I can see, there is no direct answer to it. But the answer may lay in kind of piloting in your uh, climate smart livestock project. Are you looking uh, forward to pilot something in this regard? Yeah, definitely. So our project actually is uh, going to harvest, you know, uh, finding some sort of currently issues and based on the issue, that, are, that one issue I discussed with uh, you guys. And initially we want to do some pilot and if the pilot is success, then we want to do scale up. So this is our uh, objective by the way. Okay, I, I'm just summarizing because the sound is not very loud. Uh, you're saying that uh, in your project, you are identifying the different issues and based on that, you will do some piloting. So it may very well be that you will be 
uh, piloting uh, with uh, with these uh, uh, crop residues to see how you can improve the uh, yes. the food quality or the fodder quality of these residues. And I'm seeing in the chat that Paul is also uh, adding to it. And could cowpeas also be an option? Uh, Paul, would you like to add something more to that? Uh, <clears throat> thanks. Just the project that I'm involved with uh, was, was actually trying quinoa and cowpeas and beetroot, of all things. So um, so we've been doing that in Soktrang and Haoyang. And um, I'm not really sure how it's gone, but uh, just thinking about these alternative crops, I, I guess a more general comment is that a lot of it will be local specific, right from cut and carry sort of approach to, um, you know, buying what, what are the wastes that are local, the wastes that are local and then using those and then then importing domestically and importing, you know, from over, or for other countries as well. So I think, yeah, and you, you made that point in the slide that it's going to be so case specific here and there to what are the local resources that can be used economically. Um, I know when we were in Soktrang just back in March and there was one farm, they were doing rice, putting rice straw into round bales and then exporting that. So they were, and which is terrible for carbon, like they're taking carbon out of the system, but um, an important resource for feed and for whether you're feeding worms or, or cattle. Um, I've got some colleagues on, on the, they're, they're in the in the chat as well. I don't know whether they want to talk, um, you and Sang, about the a, a corn, corn cow system in, so further up in Anjang, so it's not saline, but they're doing baby corn. They do about four crops of baby corn a year, selling that into a factory that gets processed and exported, and there's a lot of residues. So a lot of the local smallholders are using that, um, the, the baby corn, or you could use other corns as well. Um, that's quite a, a neat little system, but that's why I asked about scale. I think they're just, just you know, a few few cows. I don't know whether Sang and you want to comment on that. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, there's, there's I think feeds, feeds are a really big issue. The other, I had a couple of other questions. One was around, if, um, uh, what's the role of gender? So, what 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 role do women play in this? Do they have a role in terms of feed collection or and um, livestock husbandry or anything like that? Is there any gender interesting stories to tell about that? Yep. Sorry to ask too many questions. Okay. No. Th th thank you for asking that question. I'm sure there are stories to tell. Even not being a livestock expert, I can tell you stories on this. But um, I I like to. Uh, give Charlotte and Tit the opportunity to answer your question uh, and also thank you for bringing up the issue of residue in other areas like you mentioned example of the baby corn residues um, which are there uh, used. Um, um, I, I'm, uh, Charlotte and Tit, can you give a brief uh, reaction and then I like to go to the question that Ola has in mind. He has his hands up. Yeah, so um, in general, also asking uh, or answering the other question is, I think it would be nice to to list those crops that were mentioned uh, and to, you know, to, to kind of check them specifically, because maybe with silage, with silage technique, we can also, you know, try to store some, you know, there's there's heat of, of course involved in humidity. So maybe if you're really good silos, we can do something with silage also in Bangladesh, right? So for the potato uh, residues and with cowpea as well. In, in this case, it would be nice to, to see how we can, what we can do. So if we can list them and maybe in another kind of meeting, we can just check them out. Um, that would be nice. Um, the other question about the gender, in, in, in Bangladesh I saw a really big uh, role of, of women in, in uh, farm systems, so they are taking care of, of the cows, while the, well, in the interview it was the men that was answering the questions, and you saw the, the women whispering the answer to the men, right? So they, you see that they do the work, but um, 
but in this case, in the last two days, I think it was more balanced, right? There, there were kind of dual income. The wife takes care of, of the household, definitely. Uh, do you think there was any gender specific interesting things of the last two days? So gender? Gender. Women yeah, yeah, wife. I think so. Should yeah. be, should be. And uh, one more thing that uh, I think the also depending on the farm scale, yeah. If uh, if uh, the last scales, normally the, the 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 farmer will invest more money and may they, may they they uh, they have like make the uh, making the silage from the corn over. But for the small scale, even they don't have enough the money for the food. How can they they make the silage and how can they uh, equip with the the facility to make the silage? So so that also the the problem now. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm moving to um, to Ola with the question. And meanwhile, I put email addresses in the chat to facilitate your follow-up discussions. Uh, Ola, come in, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is actually yes. to the point that both Charlotte and Tiet have mentioned just now, and that's silaging. Uh, I, it's slightly out of out of context, <laughs> but I wanted to ask if anybody uh, in the in the group in the room has experience with uh, rice straw silaging. Mm. Do you have? For rice straw? Silage, yeah. Rice straw for uh, processing? Yeah, for silage, making silage with rice straw. Do you have experience with that? Um, no, I'm not so uh, for it if the silage or no, but for the we divide it uh, fried rice straw and fresh rice straw. So for normally they will add in the urea Yura for improve the 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 nutrition, even improve the the nutrient digestibility. Actually, we know that, but you know when we change for that technology, the farmer normally they 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 did not apply, and they think that it's very complicated. And Actually, normally, you... you know, the farmer will like do something like that. They will uh, use the molasses. Molasses will meet with the water and some some urea, and then they fry into the 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 rice straw, and they directly to for the for the, the the cow. So okay. just that technique, yeah. So, but so you you have kind of experience on a trial basis with it, but you have not seen it applied by farmers. Is that is that correct? Yeah, they they did not apply. The farmer not apply. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Even and we have some. I... So, okay. Sorry to interrupt you. Can I ask because we have people from the um, the Climate Smart Livestock Project in Bangladesh on, on the call? Uh, have you uh, uh, exp do you have experience on silaging uh, rice straw, or uh, are you planning to to work on that? <coughs> but at this point, actually, Bangladesh mostly uh, farmers are use the rice hay not the silence. So we are not moving that part, but we are uh, interested to how other crops can integrate with livestock, like that that I mentioned, you know, the uh, peanut or or the uh, uh, sweet potato vine or the other, other, other you know, the uh, leguminous crops. So that we are looking. So, yeah. Uh, we are looking at the win-win situation. We, we, cannot, yeah. uh, we cannot affect the environment, but we can earn something from the uh, environment. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And uh, Paul, can you come in with your comment? Because I think that's also a very useful comment that you're making in the chat. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> it's just, yeah, so often we, <clears throat> so down in the Mekong Delta, it's, Often three three crops a year, um, in the, in the production in the crop production areas probably less so where there's aquaculture and things, um, and and so the, our project was looking at the dry season when it's sort of the salinity comes in and what are the alternatives. So we looked at you know we looked at a an old textbook of saline tolerance and saw beetroot at the top and quinoa and sort of took that sort of biophysical approach and and off we go cowpeas yeah. as well. However, it's not not enough to grow one, you know, one season. You can't grow rice, rice, forage, 
that's not going to yeah so so it needs to be thinking how not not just for one season but how do you do it continuously over the year and then and so silage or hay or something is is yeah, yeah. going to be really important and and so i suppose because it's a small industry getting that that critical mass and getting that value chain of inputs um working is is you know a bit two steps forward one step back type of thing yeah, no, thank you very much for bringing that up. And I think, uh, Charlotte and Tiet, this links very much to the, the the complexity of the puzzle that you already brought forward. <laughs> um, but in a way, in conclusion, I, I would like to um, kind of wind up the session uh, thanking you very much for uh, bringing up uh, this topic and also in the audience for kind of contributing actively to uh, this discussion, what we see is that uh, the puzzle of how livestock will be part of the food system together with other new crops coming up and together with uh, situations in the environment being uh, uh, changing, uh, we got good information uh, to uh, that it's not only, uh, for instance, the salinity, one of the kind of most obvious uh, 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 parts, but also other parts like heat, like hygiene, um, etc., that are important. Uh, I didn't hear you much about breeding different cattle. Uh, I uh, undoubtedly among the livestock people, there will be many who think also about that. But I did hear you a lot about uh, caring uh, for cattle to see that they are well in the environment that they are. And also that will be very important towards the future because if by caring more for the animals and combining it with the agricultural system, then uh, without kind of uh, having more pressure on the environment, we can realize uh, more or more continuous production. So thank you very much for bringing all of that up. Uh, before saying goodbye, I switch over quickly to Ole uh, because he will announce the date for the next <laughs> uh, session. And you're most welcome to come to the after talks uh, in our uh, uh, platform. Uh, Ole, uh, bye from my side and over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> I was actually just looking for the 2024 program of the Delta Talks and couldn't find it. So I can only tell you it's in four weeks from now. Um, it's the number 11. Um, and I cannot tell you, unfortunately, the topic right now. But that is also good because so we're all excited and uh, we create a momentum of suspense. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you all very for much. participating and today. Thank you. Yes, bye bye. And, and uh, uh, please feel free word to forward the invitation uh, also to colleagues who might not be here today uh, uh, because we couldn't now inform you the date. Uh, but we look forward to, I think that is then Delta Talks number 10. We are a bit tricky because we had this Delta Talks live that we didn't count uh, or we did count. But we are celebrating uh, at least the 10th Delta Talks. Thank you all very much. Uh, uh, bye for now. And in the chat, you find the link to the uh, both the NFP Connect, the community, as well as to the lineup uh, on the Delta Talks. Uh, where we have a link on that as well. Thank you and goodbye. Yeah, bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks. Thanks very much.